Hi everybody, welcome to Star Techies, my way to the world of technology. Today we're joined by Chris Cox. Chris is an archaeologist who specializes in the interpretation of aerial imagery and LIDAR data. She has more than 30 years experience in the field and is the founder and director of Air Photo Services in Swindon, the UK. Not many people realize how closely archaeology and technology is linked, while this talk will provide some fascinating insight into the field. Hi Chris, welcome to Star Techie. So for people that are listening and they're not quite sure even what aerial photography is, can yeah. you give a brief explanation about what you do in sort of your day-to-day -day role and what it entails? Um, yes, aerial photography is Earth observation from either an airborne platform like an aeroplane where you would take photographs from an aeroplane and these can be taken automatically as runs of photographs or individually as photographs of sites that you see on the ground or from satellites which are space-borne platforms. They circle the Earth and take regular imaging of the Earth's surface. You may see these at Google Earth. Um, and what we can do from aerial photographs, it gives you an overview of the Earth's surface. And so we can see patterns and shapes in the crops, either as crop marks where buried features cause the crops to grow differently, or as upstanding earthworks or ramparts or buildings, and patterns of things that you wouldn't generally recognize if you were standing on the ground. When you get up there, you get a good overview of everything and you can see patterns of things which indicate where archaeological sites are. And that really is what aerial archaeology is all about. It's about observing the earth from the air. And the aerial viewpoint has become really the viewpoint of my life. I really look at everything from quite high up, even in the garden, if there's something going on. I say, go upstairs to the upstairs window and have a look out on it and see. And things do look a lot different from up there and I, I've done a lot of flying in light aircraft I was very fortunate to be able to do hours and hours of flying and observing sites and things really do change when you take off and you're up there if you ever get a chance to go in a commercial airliner or a balloon or even stand high up things look different and you can see patterns in things and that to me is really interesting and useful for environmental observation because that's what I do and why, if you take a higher view, is it easier for people to find patterns? Um, because you can see more and you can see everything all at once. Um, my tutor, Derek, had an analogy called the cat and the carpet. And if you can imagine sitting at the height of cat, a cat's head standing, looking at a very patterned carpet, you would only see little bits of it and you would see something that was confusing. But if you stood up to the height of a person, you can appreciate the pattern on a Persian carpet very much more logically. And that's what happens when you go into the air. You can see patterns and um, distant, the distant view gives you an overview, which is, enables you to find things that you wouldn't really be able to see if you were just on the ground. I mean, people used to do this on the backs of horses. Um, an elevated viewpoint would give you, before you could fly, would give you um, the ability to see things in fields or in crops. Going and standing on the top of a hill, you'd be able to see so much more of the countryside than you would down below. So um, it's not a new thing, but it's something that um, enables archaeologists to discern patterns in the landscape. I think a lot of people are quite fascinated by archaeology and had dreams of, during childhood of entering the field. So how did you become involved? Well, I have always been interested in archaeology. And when I was a small child, I lived, I grew up in Bradford in um, Northern England. And my granddad was a mechanic. And I used to be looked after by my grandma and granddad on Saturday mornings, because my mum went to work on Saturday mornings. So I used to look forward to this. I must have been two or three. And I used to go around and my granddad was in a scientific book club. And he had a book about archaeology from the book club and a book about natural phenomena, about weather and geology and volcanoes. And he used to read it and he'd read it with me and it's how he taught me to read, reading out of books about archeology. span And I became really interested in archeology span and Egyptology from a young age. And my mum was also interested in that. So she encouraged me to read about it. And 
whenever at school anybody asked me what do you want to be I said well I want to be an archaeologist and everybody would laugh but I really did and um, everybody from secondary school remembers I'm I'm still in touch with people now, as you are on Facebook with your friends from school. And somebody mentioned the other day in a meeting, you're an archaeologist, aren't you? And I said, yes. She said, yes, you always did want to do that. Yes. So that was what I always was interested in, archaeology and motorbikes. And that was it, really. And I wanted to be an Egyptologist. And so then you went to study Egyptology at university to start with. Mm -hmm. Yes, I went to a girls' grammar school and I did A-levels. I got kind of ordinary A-levels, but I, um, I studied English and economics and biology and general studies in which I did archaeology. And then I applied to the University of Liverpool because they had a course there called Archaeology of the Eastern Mediterranean, a Bachelor of Arts course. And it was a three-year course that would allow me to study Egypt, um, Mesopotamia, Syria, Jordan, Greece, and um, your European and English archaeology, British archaeology. So it was a wide ranging course. And each year you dropped one subject and specialised in something. And I specialised in Egyptology. And that's how I sort of sideways got into aerial archaeology. OK, so how exactly did you sideways get into aerial archaeology then? Well, I was always very interested in the um, in the general Egyptian history and Egyptian archaeology. We learned hieroglyphs, but we learned an awful lot about archaeology and the monuments in Egypt. And I became interested in engineering archaeology, which is basically a lot of what I do today, um, and how to manage sites in the face of modern development. And in Egypt, there was a lot of development with two big dams were built in the 20th century, which flooded an enormous part of the Nile Valley. And for our um, degrees, we had to do a dissertation, as you probably will do, you do a piece of work. And I chose to do a dissertation about the um, rescuing of monuments from um, flooding and how things were found and catalogued before um, any damage was done to them. And in this way, I discovered um, in a in a book about Nubia, a report about somebody doing aerial photography and using vertical aerial photographs to um, catalogue and find monuments in the desert. And this person was named, and he was named as Bill Abdens, who worked at the University of Kentucky. So actually, this was way before the internet. So I wrote him a letter. Dear Bill, I'm interested in what you're doing. And lo and behold, he wrote back to me and told me all about it. And he sent me some of his actual photographs and his negatives. I've still got them. And um, he was very generous. And I did my dissertation and at the end of my course, coming up the end of my course, a lady called Jill Chitty gave us an hour's worth of talk about aerial archaeology in Britain and how by flying and photographing and using old photographs, you could find out about archaeology and the landscape. And I was absolutely fascinated by it. I hadn't really um, seen any of it before. And um, you must remember, this was way before Google Earth. This was in 1983. It was way before we had internet. It's way before we could look at anything that wasn't really on paper. And um, I was fascinated by these contacts and decided that's what I'd like to do. And coming up to the end of my third year, my final year in Liverpool, um, I saw on our notice board a piece of paper that was advertising a Master of Arts degree at the University of Sheffield in Aerial Archaeology. And um, I thought that was fantastic and I looked at it and I applied and I found that it had a bursary that went with it. This was really generous that would allow the person that did that MA to do flying and photography and fly in a light aircraft and learn how to do aerial survey with an archaeologist called Derek Riley, who was um, an expert in aerial archaeology. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll never get that. <laughs> you know, that, that, I was a bit nervous about applying. I thought, well, lots of, lots of guys will apply for it. Lots of people will apply for it. I won't get that. But I applied for it and I didn't get it. But what I did get was a government grant to do it. And the person who'd applied for it didn't. So I was offered it as a second chance. And I said, yes, and I was really pleased because I was like second in line for it. And it really did start off 
my career, I suppose, in aerial archaeology. And it was very technical um, to start with and a lot to learn. It seemed quite daunting, but um, I was really pleased to be offered that course, having identified an interest in it and just seen it casually on a notice board. So it must have been for me. Oh, no, it's amazing. I love how it's almost like a, a treasure hunt to find your career. Like you found something in a book and then there's a piece of paper on, on the notice board and you followed that to find your perfect career path. So it's just like little things along the way. So it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I had been worrying about pursuing a career in archaeology. I didn't know what I would do because now we have a very big structure in England of commercial archaeology and you can work and earn a good living as a commercial archaeologist and you couldn't then. It was more like our lecturers when we joined um, the university in Liverpool. I remember them all saying, oh, I don't think you'll ever have a, be able to pursue a career in this area unless you go into academia. Now, Prince Charles, our prince, has a um, a degree in archaeology and anthropology from Cambridge, and he's a prince. There's a lot of people who archaeology is like a thinking discipline, so it's a good step up into a into a career. But people kept saying, "Well, a career in archaeology, probably not." And I just thought, yes, one day I will be able to work in archaeology. And I was very worried, though, um, thinking, oh, "What? Everybody expects you to do something." with your degree and I was worried about it and thinking oh should I go and be a lawyer should I go and do something else you know and my family were very supportive my mum was always supportive but people kept saying what are you going to do with a degree in archaeology that's what I'm going to do I said I'm going to be an aerial archaeologist (laughs) and uh, I just took a punt on it and did it and was able to go to Sheffield University for a year and learn all about it and that's when things got very technical. And I've spoken to quite a few people that have said, but haven't we found everything already? What would you say to that? Is there a lot more to find? Oh, yes. And it's why I love my job. Um, it's something I, every time I go to work, I've no idea what I may find. Because um, particularly in rural areas where there are crops, each year the crops grow differently. And if you can imagine if there's a buried settlement or a buried ditch or an enclosure around an old farmstead or a buried, um, an eroded buried monument like a Bronze Age round barrow or something like that, a funerary site. Over the years, particularly in the 20th century, agriculture has flattened a lot of things in our countryside and they're left as, as little traces beneath the soil and the crops grow differently over them, outlining the um the traces quite heavily and you can see those from the air but only at certain times uh, when it's dry or in certain weather conditions and each year it, it differs so you have good and bad years so you never know quite what you're going to see and some years you will see a lot of these crop marks and other years you'll see very few and it really is a voyage of major discovery and there is an awful lot more to be found and as we develop new techniques of observation as well we look at multispectral photography which looks at the spectral the light signatures given off by different kinds of plants we can look at infrared we can look at um photography taken at times when it's been very shadowed so tiny little bits of earthworks and things in the landscape can show that In flat light, it won't show at all. And we can also technologically enhance our photographs to um, try to look at traces which are very minimal. I enjoy doing that. And we can also use um, light detection and ranging data to model the landscape in the same way that radar does by bouncing light off the landscape, um, making a point cloud um, digital terrain model to look for very small features. So... There's a lot of multiplicity of techniques we can use from the air to actually find out so much. And I've done so many surveys where just one in just one year we found something and in other years we've seen nothing. So it really is a very exciting um, pot of possibilities, I think. And not no one avenue of investigation will give you everything. And I love that. It's like being a detective. You kind of piece together all sorts of information and we use maps as well um, to see what's on old maps um, 
what the countryside used to look like. And we can often see ghosts of what the countryside used to look like. Or we can see the remains of World War II airfields, all sorts of things that are hidden among the crops, which have now, now been taken away. And you can see them through the crops. So it really is a bit of a voyage of discovery for me. And I, I think I'm suited to do it because I have quite a heavy attention to detail. I don't get bored. And I can look through things, lots and lots of photographs all in one go. So I never really get bored with looking at things. I can remember what I've seen. And so it's good for me. But yes, it's very detailed and there's a lot of it. And I don't think we'll ever stop discovering things, especially as our techniques get more exciting and more advanced, you know. Mm -hmm. And speaking of exciting, what is the most exciting thing that you've discovered? Well, that is um, something I find difficult answering, but I, I know what it is. Um, in 2010, I started working in Hertfordshire in England on chalk soils, uh, working for the council. And it involved me going in every day. It was a contract for air photo services to their offices and looking in a layer in their geographical information system, which they'd said was really good for crop marks. Oh, and it was. Um, we began to find a lot of things that were very useful, would um, enhance the historic environment record. So I began cataloguing them straight onto the historic environment record. And there's one area of Hertfordshire that I'd been working in for years because we started working in Cambridge and um, I used to do a lot of flying in Hertfordshire and photography. And there was one particular field in North Hertfordshire on the chalk where each year I'd go back to it. I'd been flying there about 10 years. And I think there's something in that field. And it was just patches, like round patches. And it looked really messy in the crop. There is something in that field. And I kept going back and couldn't find it. And when I opened up the computer um, in the council on this particular day, I was at this field. I thought, I'm going to just have a look there. And it was full of enclosed Iron Age settlements, all buried with like great big ditches around them, pits inside, entrances. There were three or four big settlement enclosures and around it was a cemetery, all buried. And I've been looking at it for years and have never seen it because the conditions had never been right. And that taught me such a lot, that survey. In my mind, you begin to perceive where things might be, even though you can't see all the details. And so I saw it over years and years and then um, it all came together on that one day. And I felt, I just, oh my goodness. And all the, all the ladies who were working with me in the office care, I said, come, come and have a look. And everyone got really excited about it. It's not supposed to be professional to be excited about these things, but I was, I was, so this is where I've been working for years. Come and see it. You know, it was, um, it was something that I was just really pleased because it vindicated the use of my technique, which is looking at different things in different years and having the patience to wait to see what comes up. You know, it's, it's good so yeah that was that was something I really enjoyed finding so it sounds like just you have a feel for the landscape as well that's one of the skills yeah. you need to have in your area and also be have a lot of attention to detail are there other yeah. specific skill set that you would recommend people have to enter into your field um yes an analytical open mind you don't have to be particularly qualified you don't have to be the sort of person who could get lots and lots of exams right or do maths or any sort of technology. You can learn that as you go along. And it's amazing. I have an arts background and it's amazing what you can learn if you want to. And to have an open mind so that when you look at something, you don't prejudge what you might find there. You go to the question, what might I see today? What am I seeing? How am I seeing it? And how can I classify it? I learned quite a lot from uh, the writings of wartime aerial photo interpreters. Many of them were women um, because women have a particular, I mean, many men do as well, a particular orderly mindset of looking at details of things, analysing them, cataloguing and filing them away in the head. And I found that memory is a very good thing. I don't know if when you were a kid, people played card games where you had to lay out a load of picture cards and there's two or three of the same picture, loads of them, and you turn them over one at once and then you turn them back and you have to remember where the pairs are. And I was really rather good at that. I always enjoyed doing it. 
And I always enjoyed doing crosswords and I enjoy playing chess because it involves, um, it's not being clever, it involves having a mind that remembers things and can think of strategies to do things and build, building layers of memory, I think, is quite important. And it's something I'm trying very hard to pass on now because I find aerial archaeology and interpretation of photographs very easy now because I've got over 40 years worth of memory bank of it. I've looked at hundreds of thousands of photographs. And, oh, yeah, I saw that somewhere and I can remember it. I have a very good memory. And I think that helps. And uh, to start out with, though, an inquiring mind, a readiness to learn and not being afraid to ask questions. I used to remember being quite ignorant, surrounded people that say, oh, that's that, that's that. I said, what are they looking at? You know, and I, I'd always feel so. I look for trainees. I've had quite a few trainees through our company and people who've done internships or work experience who can ask questions and not be afraid to ask questions and not make assumptions and listen and learn, but actually make your, it's a, it's a field in which you can make your own judgments. And I, I really like that. It's somewhere where you can, you can shine through thinking and being able to sit down quietly and think because we are paid to think as aerial archaeologists. So I like that. It's good. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. Does that answer your question, Kirsten? Yeah, yeah it's absolutely that. perfect. Too complicated. <laughs> no, absolutely perfect. Now, thinking of questions people might be questioning at the moment, why is Chris sitting in her car? Um, what have you been doing today? <laughs> well, um, this week I've been, um, I've been doing some um, reporting from aerial photographs and uh, I have got some sites um, in Hungerford that I wanted to go out and look at again because I wasn't sure what they were and I know that I'm not going to be able to go and look at them um, in the coming weeks as I would do at the end of a project I go and ground truth some of my observations and I've made some interpretations so I'm not sure what these things are and therefore I went out to have a look at them up today because unfortunately tonight um, in England we are going to have to lock down again because of CV19. Now we work on the internet most of the time but if I go out to do site visits now I do so alone um, safely telling someone you know where I am and um, come back again so I've been to look at some sites today and um, I wanted to get that in while it was light. So I thought this is the first time I have tried doing a Zoom meeting on a telephone in my car and it's worked so I'm really pleased. But I'm sat in a car park at a supermarket now. So, <laughs> so not this. driving, no one worry, Chris isn't driving at the moment. <laughs> no, no, I'm not driving. No. <laughs> No, I wouldn't do that while I was driving, but I wanted to do this sitting in my office so I could show you some of the things on screen that I was doing. Uh, perhaps we could do that another time um, because I'd love to be able to show you some of the things that we do and how we look at things and map things. Um, but no, today, unfortunately, I had to go out and I had to um, just get this out to the way and done for one of my jobs because we do quite tightly deadline commercial jobs and I want to be able to deliver this one to my client on time. Mm -hmm. You use the word, uh, the terminology ground truthing for people that yes. aren't used to that. What does that mean exactly? I would say it's dead simple. You look out, go and have a nice day out, go on the ground um, and with the landowner's permission, if you need it, if you're off public footpaths and making sure you're safe, you go and visit the site and see what it is. And that helps you build your memory banks of what, what you're actually looking at on aerial photographs. So if I see something, I really don't know what it is. I either get someone else to go out and look at it for me or I go and look at it. So a lot of my spare time I spend, if I go out with friends or, or my partner or whatever, we go out and, and look at things. Oh, I've, I've got a load of sites in that area I want to look at. Let's go for a nice walk. So or with my family. My children are very patient. They have been taking on lots of outings to lots of strange places to look at things on. Today we're going to go and ground truth this light. It's, we just go and look at it on the ground. That's all, all it means. And obviously it really worked for your son because he's also working at your uh, business as well. Yes, he is. Um, Air Photo Services, we started it in 1990. Well, I did when uh, my son David was two um, because I found it difficult working full-time out of the house with on 
in a field archaeology role. I always wanted to be an aerial archaeologist. So I started doing this from home because you can do this. A lot of it is desk based work and it's been successful for us. And um, my son, David, has a degree um, in politics and international relations from peace studies in Bradford. He's done a lot of traveling and he's also an archaeologist. He's worked with our photo services on and off for some years. And um, he has a lot of field archaeology experience as well. So this year he's come to work with me um, as my fellow director and he's taking responsibility for training in our company. Because now, be, having been in lockdown, um, we have been very fortunate. I applied for a cultural recovery fund grant from the government for air photo services and we were awarded one. So David has a lot of experience in, um, he's, he worked for the British Council in Malaysia, where he's still there. So he's opened his office there and he's looking at um, training, um, putting our training material online, sorting out the manual to take everything out of my head and on, onto a document and actually get, we used to do quite a lot of personal, interpersonal training for people. Um, getting a lot of our training material online and uh, making sure that everything is recorded and videoed so that we can tell new people working for us how to work with us and work remotely with people. So that's what he is in charge with for me at the moment and helping to run that uh, grant aided project throughout the year. So I'm very pleased he's come to join us. Um, bringing again a new perspective to it of somebody younger, somebody who has a different perspective on training. He's done a lot of professional development training, both in archaeology and in business throughout Southeast Asia. So he's bringing new experience of both archaeology and aerial archaeology and work dynamics to our business. And I'm, I'm really pleased he's, he's joined us. It's good. Now you have different locations around the world. People might be thinking, you know, who's paying for for your services? Who's actually wants this satellite imagery? So what kind of organizations or people are you working with? Well, um, we have always worked primarily with UK-based property and land developers. And there's a requirement under the UK planning law and planning set up since 1989-90. Um, to um, undertake environmental assessment and archaeology and heritage is part one part of environmental assessment we work alongside ecologists people who look at noise people who look at the effects on society of development and we work in the planning system on behalf of consultants who are representing developers and our work contributes towards what's called desk-based assessment and environmental assessment where the first port of call as a non-intrusive investigation to see what may be there. So we do site investigations for developers who need our services in order to get planning permission to do their development so that the um, things that have to be done to preserve archaeology or to deal with archaeology on site can be done. So we provide the first level of archaeological information for them. Um, we do a lot of infrastructure work. And by the word infrastructure, I mean, we work for roads and railways, people who are building large developments in the countryside. We did an enormous amount of work about over about 10 years looking at aerial photographs along the route of the um, planned A14 in Cambridgeshire, which is a big road, it's a massive road scheme. And our maps were used in geographic information systems by archeologists on the ground to plan where to dig and give points of reference as to where to investigate things. And from that, they found a lot more, you find a lot more on the ground than you do from the air. And we contributed, we were one of the people doing the uh, remote sensing work for the high speed to railway development in England, which is probably the biggest railway development in Europe really. And they were work, we were working ahead of any construction to contribute to environmental statements. So we work as con consultants and contractors to provide mapping from aerial photographs and reports, interpretive reports for these projects. Um, one project, the project I'm finishing off this month is a large onshore cable route area from an offshore wind farm in North, um, Norfolk. And we've been looking at aerial photographs from the internet because it's all been internet based we've done this all in lockdown 
and we have been working through that, making a map in a geographical information system, a digital map of where our sites are, and writing a big report about, about it and giving it that as a database to our contractor, which is Equinor, a, a company that runs um, wind farm development. Um, so their archaeologists can go out and find sites on the ground. So they, we are paid to do that. So the majority of my pay comes for our, our revenue in the company comes from selling our services and our skills to developers. And we design the projects, execute them, find all the, all the sources for them and advise people on how to use aerial archaeology and remote sensing in these projects so that people can find sites. And besides Corona, what other what challenges do you have to this type of work? You've obviously been you've adapted a lot. Yes, a lot. You're still working. Um, oh, yes. It, are there many challenges that impact on your business or you seem to really overcome them so maybe you don't even see them as challenges um i think business leadership and resilience is a very important thing and our business has changed hugely over the years because the challenge to me intellectually has been not to stand still um, i knew when i started this and getting back to technology that we are only just begun we're at the beginning we were using tapes and punch cards to store things when we started and the challenge to me has been to keep up with technology this is a big challenge and work with all the new things that come out and actually know about them so the challenge has been to assimilate a lot of change we've been working here now for 30 years and in 30 years our technology has come on vastly it's brilliant um so something that may be the absolute ultimate thing one year will be superseded by something else. It's my job to evaluate, do we really need it? Are we still at the sharp end of what we're doing? Is it going to help us? And each year we have conferences and people who confer together about this. So it's actually keep your handle on the technology it is a challenge. It is for anyone. Um, making sure that the skills are there in my business so that it's not just me so that I'm passing my skills on as Derek Riley my tutor did to me he said to me Chris you've got to pass these skills on to other people so I've been trying to pass my skills on to others and I found it very challenging because I find it quite easy to do and actually helping people to learn it in an understandable way and it takes quite a long time to learn is a challenge to me so that's where I've got David on board to help me my son because he's very good at helping people to learn things and he's very good at getting me out of myself and actually being able to explain it properly to other people so that is a challenge um, having access to the material that I want to use it was a big blow. I always knew that the Historic England Archive here is a big archive of our photos in England. And I always dreaded it closing. But gosh, what if they close it and take that away? But I could, I'd see, I'm, I'm relatively good at spotting change happening. And after looking after our health, which is very important, I want to see, right, we're going to continue working. Where are we going to get other things from? And I actually enjoy finding things out. So I've managed to get over that challenge partly and moving into different areas actually um, pleases me as long as we can continue using the skills we've got. And there's not that many of us. So I've not got a massive organisation to take forwards, but I have got some challenging things to sort out really to make sure that the skills that we've got in the company I can keep here I don't I had to make one redundancy from um, a, of a trainee and that really upset me um, but I did that so the others of us could keep working and keep the geographic information skills the technical skills because I brought other people on board and taught them technical skills because I can't do it all mm -hmm. at all um, so I have people doing specific technical things for me and they, they go way beyond my, my knowledge of certain things. And I really want to keep those people on board because it's important to me. Keeping our skills is a challenge at the moment. But hopefully with this generous grant we've been given, I can, I can help 
um, the company to move forward into new areas and learn. And we've now got time to learn those new areas because learning things can be quite challenging to anyone. Mm -hmm. Learning new stuff, you say, oh, there's all these new things to do. But it can be quite challenging on top of earning a living to actually learn new things. And I think to anyone. Um, so they are the main challenges to is actually learning things and giving yourself time to learn things while continuing to earn enough money to sustain the company and to pay everyone's salaries and to make sure that we have um, a sustainable way of living. That is challenging. And mm -hmm. I think more so now, but um, we seem to be quite resilient to it because we just are. But I can see that as a major challenge. Are there many aerial archaeologists? Because you're speaking about your company and, and you're a small yeah. team, but yeah. it's quite a niche area. Um, yes, it is. is it, how, how many do you think there would be like in, in England itself? Oh, probably less than, than 40 or 20 of us that I know. There's not many, but I probably know all of them. Um, we are in a Europe and worldwide group called the Aerial Archaeology Research Group. We've been going since, oh, the first time we met was probably 1983. And we've grown enormously out into Europe since then. We have meetings with about 100 people there. Um, now our next meeting will be virtual, of course. I, I am one of the trustees of that group, so we, we will meet virtually. Um, and I know a lot of the, of people in the aerial archaeology research group. It, there's not many of us, but they're enough. But it's an area where I'm afraid there are not enough skills. It's not taught very commonly in universities. And that's how I found out about it, just by hearing an hour's lecture in a university. So I've tried to give teaching. I'll be giving some teaching into Edinburgh University for my friend Rebecca Bennett, who's teaching there remotely, of course, like this, too just contribute to her course and trying to get more work more more teaching out there remotely is very important to me at the moment to ensure that we sustain and uh, the government do um, historic england have an air survey team which is very well respected and they do something called the national mapping program in england where they work from aerial photographs routinely i work with them a lot um, I know them, they don't do commercial work, but they do excellent research and historical record work. So I do work with them a lot. And one of our trainees went to work with them. So we, we work together and they've just been passing some new computer programs to me to evaluate and use. So it's very nice. We have a very, it's a very small, but very friendly um, way of working. I, I love to be able to mentor younger people to do this, you know, to come up and take these skills and, um, we are one of the few commercial organisations, though it is practised commercially in um, some of the bigger consultancies. But um, And there is Alison, who used to work for me. She runs her own business very successfully in the north of England, doing exactly what we do. And I greatly admire her work. It's good. So, you know, we are a close-knit community of niche professionals, really. And for the students that might be listening to this and really interested in getting involved in aerial photography, but they see that this is not specifically a unit at university, they could yeah. just do a Bachelor of Archaeology. How would you recommend they get involved in this area specifically then? Well, um, it depends what you are doing. Um, you can join the Aerial Archaeology Research Group. Um, it is a very useful group to join. I am starting next month, I'm going to be starting um, a Chartered Institute for Archaeology Special Interest Group. And we also used to, we haven't done it, we've done one work experience this year, but we do offer work experience at Air Photo Services. And I would always give advice to somebody who wanted to get into aerial archaeology individually if they wanted to contact me. And my, my details are on my website. And I particularly um, want to encourage young women into this profession. It can seem daunting to step into a technical profession if you don't have scientific A-levels or scientific baccalaureate or any, any um, qualifications to do that. But it isn't. It's what I did. And it's nice to have somebody just to encourage you. And I also, I always feel, I always answer anybody who writes to me. Uh, email me I always answer and would send you links to things you could read things you could watch things you there were webinars on from historic England um 
and groups you can join like the aerial archaeology research group and we will welcome people it's a very very welcoming profession we wouldn't send you off saying oh you know we don't want to be bothered with that i always very um assiduous in in answering anyone who wants work experience and we are as part of our grant aided work developing an online work-like experience for people who can experience a little bit of do, doing this and um Myself and Rebecca Bennett with her company PTS Consultancy, we run or did until last year, we run courses in geographic information systems, aerial imagery interpretation and LIDAR. And part of our grant aided work is to be taking those online as well. So we're going to make them quite simple, quite direct, very, very inclusive and, sim and um, accessible. So we're just at the beginning of that work now, really. So we've sort of come through six months of seven months of lockdown. We know where we are. And so we want we want to try now to start reaching out and putting some of our things online so that people can come back to us for training. Because we're running all that personally in Swindon at our offices in England. And um, I want to be able to make that worldwide now for people who wish to access it through the Internet. OK, so anyone that's listening at the moment is interested in this field, remember to reach out because she's very welcoming. She reached out to start with and this is how she got into the area. So it's always important to reach out and mentorship is extremely important. It is. It's very important to me as well to give other people a chance, a good chance to do something if they really want to. And if I can't give a chance to be able to put you in the direction of somebody who can and be welcoming and respectful of somebody's ambition to do something because I was second in line for the course I applied for and I thought oh, I have no chance of getting that and and yet I got it and one thing I would always say is if you don't ask you will never get anything it's nice to be able to have the confidence to ask somebody and um, no matter how important or senior you think somebody is I'm not at all all I do is run a small company and I only know a lot about this because I've been doing it for 40 years because I'm nearly 60 so I would really like I like it if people will reach out and just ask because I'd be very happy to advise and to help anybody who has interest in aerial archaeology or indeed entering archaeology at any level. Um, I do MVQ assessments, national vocational qualification through the British CIFA and would welcome any candidates who came along to do that. Um, you have to pay to do it or have an institute to support you. But anybody who came along to ask to do that, I started doing that because you don't need to have a qualification to do this. It's an entry level thing. And I think it's very important that um, our GIS technician at work, Adam, he is extremely knowledgeable. He has one A level and that's in archaeology. And that's all he has. He doesn't have a degree, but he is, he's got professional accreditation from the CIFA and it doesn't matter he knows an awful lot about what he does and we mentored him to start as a as a young man straight out of school not quite knowing where he wanted to go and now he's got to, 10 years later an excellent career in gis so it can be done by asking and accepting you may have to work up and do some you know research yourself around it but um i'd be very pleased um you know to 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 anyone who genuinely wanted to enter this area. Perfect. Uh, one last question before we go into the questions from the viewers. Um, mm. What is some of the latest, you were talking about technological advancements in the field previously, and I know you've been working with some satellite imagery that when we yeah. spoke about earlier, what are some of the latest technological advancements in the field that people really should think about? <laughs> Well, I've been um, very pleased to be looking at um, being able to get hold of small areas of satellite imagery for not, not that much cost at very high resolutions, which mean that you can see a lot of detail on them um, from lots of different years. And they, they are available. That's been very interesting for me to be. That's what I'm looking at at the moment, evaluating which sources of new things are best for for me um, looking at things with different uh, spectral bands different color bands how to enhance photographs that's been very useful to me um, working with geographic information systems and doing a lot of um, mapping and 
working with new georeferencing programs which are more accurate and um, my colleague in the Netherlands is working on um, artificial intelligence which we have been looking at for some years actually automatic recognition of um, crop conditions um, from well look, from looking at crop conditions to looking at automatic recognition of archaeological sites from there we're in the early stages of that that is very exciting and over the last five years since we've had um, lidar light detection and ranging data available to us free in England from the Environment Agency, we've been looking at different ways of visualising and processing it to technologically make the best of it, to visualise archaeological sites. So we've been using data in lots of different ways and inventing um, different uh, plugins, different programmes, looking at coding, all sorts of things to try and find out what's the best way of using data. Um, and that's come a long way for me from simply sitting looking at um, aerial photographs on paper in an archive and I've had to have a lot of help with that from people who are specialists in computer areas or who know about um, LIDAR or artificial intelligence so it's all been quite exciting really and there's a lot of uh, a lot of new things going on at the moment and being in lockdown has given me time to think about it and consider it and read around it and that to me has been invaluable actually having the time to really find out about a lot of new developments in this field. And it just shows how much technology is involved in archaeology. So all oh, the yeah. people that couldn't see the connection, there is such an obvious connection. There's so much technology being utilised now, the latest technology. Well, yes, I mean, it's used on site. Um, it, when we're digging, when you know, people think that archaeology is simply digging things up. If somebody's digging trenches, we can um, use drones to make um, a 3D model of the site and to map it without having to um, map that all on the ground. We can use phot photogrammetry to map sections or plans. Um, there's many technological advances that are, are making archaeological recording um, very simple and very effective in terms of 3D modelling. So there's a lot of technology there that we can use. Great. Um, now let's go to the Q&A from the listeners. Okay, Michaela, some of the questions, please. Hmm. How do the different technologies differ then? I guess, how is LiDAR different to satellite imagery? Perhaps that's what Madeline is asking. different forms of data collection. Um, LiDAR technology is um, it's bouncing light off the earth to make um, a 3D model. Um, satellite imaging can be simply photographing, photographing from space or using multispectral sensors which find out about the Earth's surface by different, um, different methods. Um, so you can have very simple technology. You can just use computer technology to record and analyze things. Or you can use technology that actually processes things, computer programs that process and um, visualize things for you. So there is a, a very wide range of things you can use. And there is specific technology that you use on with different, when do you use LiDAR over satellite imagery? Um, I would use it in conjunction with it. I don't use LiDAR alone because it's only a model of the Earth's surface. So I like to look at satellite imagery and air photos with it. But I'd use LiDAR in a landscape where I'd expect to see some topography, some ups and downs in the landscape. And I use it when I want to be able to find what I call micro topography, which is small small differences in the Earth's surface to see if there's anything very residual there. That's when I'd really use LIDAR would come into its own or doing earthwork survey. Um, particularly I put light, I use LIDAR survey over crop marked sites to see if the site is fully eroded or not. A lot of the time we can't see any topography there at all, any ups and downs in the earth. And that would help me, I'd use LIDAR to assess the condition of sites I know are there, but I probably don't see on the earth's surface. And I, from LIDAR I can measure the um, profile of sites, even 10 centimetres on the ground you can measure. And so I could see if they had any residual earthworks if I used LIDAR. So it helps me um, look at the condition of 
site and LIDAR data, um, LIDAR survey can sometimes penetrate low leaf woodland. So if I had sites that were now under woodland or scrub, I could uh, use it to penetrate and remove the woodland and see the earth's surface underneath. And that's when I'd really use LIDAR to see if I could find earthworks in woodland. Very interesting. Oh, that's great. It's really good. Yeah. I, if you can get the light beams to penetrate through the leaf canopy. So we do that at times when we call it low leaf index, like, like this time of year from November to March, when there's not many leaves and you can get light through it, then we can find sites in woodland. And that's really exciting. It's good. Mm -hmm. Next question. Oh, I think we've already covered this a little bit, but are there many more archaeological archaeological discoveries to be made? That's a great question. And yes, there are. Um, people are making discoveries all the time. The Earth is a very large and wonderful place. And I used to think when I was a kid that everybody had explored everything and there was no more discoveries to be made. There's a huge amount of underwater archaeology, the archaeology of the ocean bed. Um, the archaeology of the normal countryside in England, we see different things each year on aerial photographs and throughout the world. Um, yes, there are. And buried, buried archaeology underneath cities, every time in some areas people dig, Roman cities or in ancient cities, we always find, yes, there is a lot more discovery to be made. And uh, there will always be things for archaeologists to think about. Because what people don't realise as well is... That archaeology is the technique of studying the past by its physical remains, buildings, people, things, artifacts, and it doesn't stop at prehistory. It goes all the way up through the medieval to the historic period, and I do an awful lot from the air of archaeology of the Second World War in Europe, um, First World War, and into the Cold War. Um, there's an awful lot of archaeology of the Cold War, archaeology of the world wars the 20th century which is incredibly interesting and remains to be discovered alongside documentary things so i find that modern archaeology particularly exciting and the range of discoveries we can make is is almost infinite so yes there is yeah that's good so if you're thinking about studying archaeology don't worry there are still be things to discover when you <laughs> finished yes it's a very wide ranging discipline and one of the lovely things to me of being an archaeologist is wherever you are there is always something to be interested in in the environment and I found it's an extremely rich intellectual discipline my kids have grown up with it and wherever we've been we've been able to see something of interest from an archaeological perspective they probably get sick of me banging on about it but uh, I don't think they have done because one of them is working with me now and um we find an, an enormous amount of rich discovery in the world. It's not just archaeology. As an archaeologist, you, you appreciate the environment, the natural environment, animals, plants, vegetation, crops. We've, I've learned an awful lot about agriculture, about land use, about farming. And so wherever you are, you know things about things. And it's nice to have that connection with the past and with your, with your landscape. I even know about buildings and things like this because you learn it along the way as as an archaeologist and to be somewhere modern, somewhere old, um, you can always make a comment on the architecture or know about it. It makes me feel quite grounded. It's nice. It makes you feel part of the world we're in. So yes, there's a lot of archaeological discoveries to be made. What skills do I need to have, have to work in this field? Um, I would say initially curiosity, an open mind, um, patience and att attention to detail and um, an ability to learn things and to catalogue them in your mind and be objective and um, well organised and creative as well actually being able to think clearly and think of things and be patient with what you're doing. And those skills translate very well into the job market in general. So if oh, you they studied archaeology, you decide that it's not for you later on? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. They do. It's called transferable skills. Mm. And as an archaeologist, you learn to do a lot of processes and you can learn things. You learn how to catalogue things. You learn how to record things. You learn how to remember things. You learn how to compare things. And it really does give you what I call analytical thinking skills. And they are very valuable. Indeed.
Why did you change from Egyptology to aerial photography? Oh, yes, that's a good one. Um, I didn't do it deliberately and it made me feel very sad, but I never really changed from Egyptology because I'm still very interested in it and have been able to do quite a lot of work from the air in Egypt. It was a natural progression. Um, I discovered the survey technique while working in Egyptology and um, began to do a lot of detailed work from aerial archae aerial photographs in Egypt and um, it came at that moment when I found there was a course in aerial archaeology and dis I just decided to do that I, I, that's what I'd really like to do and before that I'd actually planned to be um, to do a PhD in Egyptology in Egyptian technology and um, the development of building technology in ancient Egypt and um, I changed from that and when I saw there was a course in aerial, photo aerial photography and aerial archaeology I decided to do that instead and I, I don't regret it but there's times when I feel sad that I'm not still an Egyptologist purely uh, because a lot of my colleagues and friends from university still are but it, this is what I do now and I am um, I made that choice deliberately to move into aerial archaeology and I, I don't regret it it was at that moment when I saw that there was a course advertised in it and I had a look at it I went for the interview and I thought yes that's what I want to do well they both sound like fascinating areas of work so it doesn't sound like you missed out <laughs> Oh, no, I didn't. I don't feel I've missed out on anything. I've, it's been an incredibly rich, rich career of, um, of great interest and being able to retain. Like when we started, uh, every time Egyptology always reminds me of, of my granddad mm -hmm. and he would be very proud to see now what I've done with that knowledge of Egyptology because it would not because it's a great achievement or anything it would interest him he would find it interesting and um, intellectually stimulating and know that it's what I'd wanted to do so it was like a natural progression from Egyptology it was just one branch of it I found aerial archaeology through Egyptology and just... there, there's also there's a big project called the Iamina project um, which runs in um, Egypt, Africa, the Middle East. Um, it's a Durham University project and they do a lot of um, research and work into, from the air and satellite imagery into um, erosion of archaeological sites in the eastern Mediterranean and they do a lot, of, a lot of interesting work there. So we've been able to do a bit of work with them so you can actually marry the two but most of my work by choice has been in, in the United Kingdom because that's where I'm based my children were here and we are now really pretty firmly based in the UK planning system um, so I've not done a lot, lot more work in the Middle East and Egypt and it's something I'd like I'd have always thought I would come back to it in the future and perhaps that future is now you know to sort of move a little bit back into that now but only from an aerial perspective you know it's good there's plenty of things going on in that area as well. So, yes, I'd like to uh, perhaps move back into it. But most of the jobs that we have are mainly in Britain now or in Europe. Well, there's definitely lots of fascinating things to discover in Britain. Oh, yeah. yeah. All of history, everywhere you look, it's just the... Yes. Okay, next question then. What kind of companies do you work with? Oh, um, consultancies. Big, bigger environmental consultancies like RSK, um, RPS in England, Equinor in Norway, uh, people that build things, big consultancies that build things, highways agency um, or specialist heritage consultancies like Orion Heritage um, or local, local planning authorities who want work doing um, from a planning perspective, they would commission us to do work. So everything from small companies, sometimes we work for individuals who have a building issue or a planning issue, they want sorting out from aerial photographs. So I also do legal work from aerial photographs. I do legal and planning work. I look at land use analysis, access, boundaries, things that people have problems with. I work with a lot of major solicitors and um, chambers of barristers who represent clients who need evidence for their cases. But again, it's working in planning, heritage and aerial photography. So I use aerial imagery to provide evidence for legal cases. So I work with legal clients as well. 
So lots of different companies, lots of different organizations. A, a lot, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked for HS2 Limited. We worked for big, um, big engineering consultancies like Arup, um, who have heritage teams, and I work as part of their heritage team, uh, designing their products and telling them how we can use aerial um, imagery and um, putting together teams of people to fulfill their needs for it. The last question is from Michaela. It's her favorite question from our founder. Um, if you had some general life advice to give to teenagers or life advice that you wish you'd been given as a teenager yourself, what would it be? Um, rely on your own instincts and knowing what you want to do yourself. And that's not always easy. Not following things, not to be a follower, but to be a leader in your own desires to do things. If you have an idea to do something professionally or work-wise and everybody around you says, oh, you can't possibly do that. Oh, no, no. Think of ways to do it. Don't be put off and have, I needed this when I was younger, a little bit more confidence to stick your neck out and say, no, I would like to do that. How do I do that? And Rather than just keeping it all inside, thinking, oh, I'm very confused, I don't know what to do, ask somebody. And having the, I think really having the confidence to ask questions, simple questions. I'm interested in this. What can I do with this as a job? How could I use this skill? And if you don't know what to do, I did this once. I sat down with a notebook and pen and just wrote down everything I was good at or everything I thought I was good at, and then asked somebody else to tell me what they thought I could do. And to distill that really into one thing is think for yourself and be confident in what you think. And that's really difficult to do when you're younger. I know it. I, I still find this at, at my own age. And say, no, you know what you're doing. And sometimes it's difficult to remember that. So try to cultivate the ability to think for yourself and be proud of what you think mm -hmm. and to take what you think seriously yourself about yourself it's not being arrogant it's actually appreciating the things you're good at and the things you want to do and if you find something in life you really want to do and you're keen on doing you will do very well at it because you approach it with enthusiasm, realism and resilience because you keep on wanting to do it. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect. Very powerful life advice. Some mm. simple things I think that people forget to do and that you really need to do to move yourself forward. Well, yeah, be nice mm. to yourself and appreciate mm. yourself and um, mm. not to keep thinking about the things that are not very good about yourself because that's very easy for me to do. I'll, you know, say, oh, I should have done better at that. I'm not very good at that, am I? But when you've done something, it doesn't matter what. Cooked a nice meal at home, looked after a child at home, helped somebody with their homework, done something for somebody else that only you could do that you feel proud of. Turn around to yourself and in your head, in your head say, I did well there. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that. I'm good at that. And it's not arrogant. It's actually a lot of people are brought up not to think well of themselves. It's, I always thought it was an English thing, but it's not. And women are particularly guilty of this sometimes, thinking, oh, I didn't do very well there. I wonder if everybody else think I'm stupid if I don't worry about what other people think. Act um, kindly to other people, be polite, but do not worry if people disapprove of what you're doing. Because sometimes people may be jealous or they may feel bad about what you're doing because they're not doing something well themselves. That does not matter. It's what you think that counts. And to have that bit of confidence in what you're doing, even in the small things that you can do well and the kindnesses that you show to other people and the respect you show to other people are paramount in the success you'll have when you move through life. And it doesn't matter what you do, whether you bring your family up well or you pursue a career as the CEO of a huge organisation. The same premises apply that you need to and to be kind to people at all levels in your organisation, to have respect, the same respect for a cleaner as you would have for a boss. Absolutely the same. And you probably go quite far doing that. To be respectful and kind to other people is what I would advocate very much. 
but most of all to be kind to yourself mm-hmm. yes definitely mm-hmm. very great advice uh, so but, thank you well, I, anyway. I think it's great be kind to yourself be asked for help and be as confident as you can be and and yeah, kind of being not a weakness right. being kind to others no. is not a weakness because i think some people see it as that especially with women um women no. to be stereotypical <laughs> a little yeah, that was more kind and people yes. sometimes see that as a weakness so don't no it isn't you you your empathy for others it doesn't you don't need to allow people to walk all over you also cultivate the ability to say no and the ability to say no very nicely and you don't have to explain why you're saying no if somebody asks you to do something at work or at home and you really don't want to do it and you know you know that you can't you haven't got time to do it say no I cannot do that I'm sorry and move on and without having to explain women feel that they have to say yes to everything and that I've been guilty of this in the past. It's how you get too busy at work and you have lots of things to do. To say, no, I can't do that and not feel guilty about it. And to be able to discriminate if somebody comes to you and they need a kindness, the nicest thing you can do is say, yes, I will listen. But you don't have to agree with what they're asking you to do for them. But you can listen. And having that ability to say no sometimes is very important. Knowing where you stand. I think, well, I can't do that. Um, and that's actually very important, I think, for people. Definitely. You know, having that that confidence to just say, well, you know, not today, thank you. <laughs> um, so thank- no, that's where I am, really. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Chris, for an absolutely fascinating discuss- discussion. We'll let you go so you can actually get off site and get back home. <laughs> things go. So I'm going to go home now. But if any of the audience do want to ask me a question, um, Michaela and Kristen have got my contacts and I'd be very pleased to answer anything. And thank you all very, very much for coming along listening. It's been nice talking to you. I've not been able to see you, but um, thank you for your attention. It's been interesting for me as well to meet meet you as an organization thank you so much chris and everyone if you just want to have any contact with chris just send us an email or yeah. contact us on social media and we'll forward the information to chris yeah you can also follow her on what's your website airphotoservices.co.uk yeah, airphotoservices.co.uk. <laughs> exactly and we're on uh, we're on linkedin and facebook as well you'll find us as our photo services so if you want to come along and you know connect with us there that'd be great okay perfect thank you so much once again chris it's been wonderful great discussion thank you have a a good rest of day and uh, i hope to be able to be in contact with you soon bye-bye